Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I've come to Moscow to seek out the man responsible for the biggest leak of top-secret intelligence documents the world has ever seen. Russia has given him sanctuary. America wants him back. His name is Edward Snowden. Opinion is sharply divided on what he has done. He's betrayed his workmates, he's betrayed his institution, and he's betrayed the secrets of his homeland. He's a hero. To me, it seems clear that what he did was in the public interest. Edward Snowden is a traitor. What he has done has caused irreparable damage to our ability to protect the people we are sworn to protect. Edward Snowden has raised the debate over privacy and national security to a new level. Framing the agenda for this autumn's parliamentary debate over new legislation regulating the intrusive powers of the intelligence agencies. It's taken us three months to try and secure Edward Snowden's first British television interview. I've never spoken directly to Edward Snowden. All we were told was to come to Moscow, check into a hotel, provide a number of the room, and Edward Snowden would come and knock on the door. Nice to see you. Sorry, sorry. You found us. <laughs> yeah. Come in. Why did you decide to do what you did? When I was sitting at my desk at the NSA working with tools of mass surveillance every day, I saw that all of our communications were being intercepted all of the time in the absence of any suspicion of wrongdoing. And this was something that was occurring without our knowledge, without our consent. Snowden worked as an analyst for America's all-seeing national security agency, the NSA. The National Security Operations Center. The agency collects raw electronic data from around the world that is fed to America's spies and their Western partners. The NSA has a reputed budget of over $10 billion a year, over 30,000 employees, and it is the most powerful intelligence agency on the planet. I had a special level of clearance called PrivAC, uh, Privileged Access. Now, I had access to everything, and that included documents from the British government. The UK's equivalent of the NSA is the Government Communications Headquarters, or GCHQ, based in Cheltenham. GCHQ is the most secret and sensitive building in Britain. It's the electronic nerve centre that hoovers up vast amounts of data from all over the world and feeds it to MI5 and MI6 to help them identify and track terrorists, criminals and other threats. GCHQ is, for almost all intents and purposes, a subsidiary of the NSA. They provide technology, they provide tasking and direction as to what they should go after. And in exchange, the GCHQ provides access to communications that are collected in the United Kingdom. Cornwall is where most of the data comes in and goes out via cables under beaches like Porth Curnow. There's little about the internet that Dr. Joss Wright does not know. It's transmitting through the air. But the vast majority of the data is coming in across physical cables that run under the sea, across the Atlantic, several of which run under the beach that we're standing on, providing the data to the rest of the country. It's much easier than traveling by satellite. Cables have been snaking under Port Kurnow's sands for almost 150 years.
so what's this? So this hut is the termination point for some of the telegraph cables from the early 20th century. You've got cables here, copper cord cables that would have run to Spain, France, Portugal, and they lo were located here and relayed the signal to the rest of the country. Today, it's still cables that carry all our personal data and internet traffic. Only now they travel along optical fibers in cables that lie beneath Cornwall's beaches. So this is one of the modern fiber optic cables that carry internet traffic across the Atlantic. What amount of data can these cables carry? A, a large internet company, Cisco, have a, a relatively recent estimate that there are equivalent to probably maybe 650,000 DVDs worth of data transiting the UK every hour as of last year. That's a huge amount. It's a huge amount of data. Edward Snowden revealed how this bulk data was secretly collected by GCHQ via its top security station high on the cliffs of Cornwall above Bude. The programme was called Tempera. GCHQ's Tempera programme was shared with the NSA as the information gleaned from it benefited both. The two agencies are extremely close and have been since World War II. GCHQ also relies on the NSA to supplement its budget. At the root of Edward Snowden's concern is the ability of the agencies to collect this bulk data. It contains details of all our communications, like when and where they were made and where they were sent. It's this metadata the agencies are interested in, rather than content. Privacy activist Eric King has studied bulk data collection. Tempora was Edward Snowden's first major revelation. It was the first ever confirmation that GCHQ are undertaking mass internet surveillance here in the UK. Every single piece of information that's on that fiber optic cable is pushed through GCHQ's filtering, analysis and processing system here at GCHQ Bude. And it works both ways. GCHQ taps into the incoming cables from America and elsewhere and into the cables that leave the UK with all our domestic communications. Bulk data collection will be a central issue in the new legislation. The government believes it is vital. They have particular targets, but to find out who those targets are, they've got to collect mass data. Why did that happen in secret? Why did that happen without the public's awareness? Why didn't we, the public, have a choice to vote on whether or not that's something that we agree with? And they say, and in many cases this is true, uh, that they're not going to you know, read your email, for example, but they can. And if they did, you would never know. To access the information they need, GCHQ uses sophisticated algorithms to help identify needles in this giant haystack of data. David Anderson QC, the government's independent reviewer of terrorist legislation, was asked by the Prime Minister to recommend changes to the current surveillance laws. GCHQ say that they only look at a tiny, tiny fraction of all the data that they collect. Well, if that's the case, why do they need to collect all the data? Unfortunately, there is no way of predicting in advance exactly which packet of information on which cable uh, contains the incriminating information, which may disclose the existence of a plot. Bulk data can also be collected in a more intimate and personal way via hacking our smartphones. They now account for an increasing amount of all internet traffic and are a godsend for the agencies the secret doorway to all our data and internet use. What information, what intelligence 
can the agencies get from this a smartphone? Snowden told us about a secret GCHQ training program codenamed Smurfs, cartoon characters devised by Belgian comic artist Peo. Dreamy Smurf is the power management tool, which means turning your phone on or off without you knowing. Even if I've turned my phone off. Right. And then we've got Nosy Smurf. What's Nosy Smurf? Nosy Smurf is the, the hot miking tool. So for example, if it's in your pocket, they can turn the microphone on and listen to everything that's going on around you. Even if my phone is switched off? Even if your phone's switched off because they've got the other tools for turning it on. Tracker Smurf, what's Tracker Smurf? Uh, that's a geolocation tool which uh, allows them to follow you with a greater precision than you would get uh, from the typical triangulation of cell phone towers. They want to own your phone instead of you. Snowden also reveals that GCHQ has another way of collecting bulk data using what is known as Computer Network Exploitation, or CNE. Authorization governing its use is likely to figure in the new legislation. Computer Network Exploitation is basically digital espionage. You're trying to control things that you don't own. What the intelligence agencies like to do is they'll hack those network service providers and secretly take ownership of the devices that are uh, affecting traffic. Without the service providers knowing about it. Without the service providers ever knowing about it. It's a posh word for hacking, um, or sometimes called equipment interference. Um, but it's done by the government by allowing them to attack directly um, the server or the terminal. This is the capability that GCHQ have invested most heavily in in recent years. What it allows them to do is essentially limitless. They can remotely attack core points of communications, of infrastructure, of companies, whatever there's a, wherever there's a piece of technology, that's where GCHQ can deploy this. Snowden showed how aggressive GCHQ are in using it. One Snowden document revealed how GCHQ secretly used CNE to access vast amounts of communications data from inside Pakistan, presumably to help identify and track terrorists. It did so by secretly hacking routers, that's digital junction boxes, manufactured by the American company Cisco. GCHQ noted, capability against Cisco routers allows us to reroute selected traffic across international links towards GCHQ's passive collection systems. Cisco did not know it was being hacked by GCHQ. The interception was legally signed off by the British government. Is it right that the government should authorise GCHQ to hack into American routers to gain access to all the data from Pakistan? Well, I think anyone who knows anything about uh, espionage or intelligence work knows that it is about authorising people to do things that would normally be against the law. That's why you need people of the weight and seniority of judges uh, to decide that it really is acceptable to authorise it in any particular circumstance. At the moment, these warrants are authorised by ministers. The role of the judiciary in authorising warrants for interception and intrusive surveillance will also be a prominent feature of the new legislation. I don't think it works anymore. Last year, the Home Secretary authorised 2,345 warrants herself, personally. Nobody else can do it for her. That's a huge burden on somebody who has to run a vast Department of State. We need a system that could be operated by a judicial-led body, which is what they have particularly in the US, where there is a court uh, which authorises those things. In America, judicial authorization is the norm. General Michael Hayden, former director of the National Security Agency and the CIA, believes the UK would be well advised to do the same. I would suspect that GCHQ would welcome that kind of process as well to show to the broader British public that they have nothing to hide and that the grounds on which they pursue these warrants are actually very substantial. And they would be signed off by a judge. They would be signed off by a judge rather, rather than, than by a, a minister. Rather, rather than Do you by think a that would increase public confidence? 
I, I, I think it would. It certainly increases public confidence in the American system. The agencies say that Snowden's revelations have caused huge damage, and in particular alerted terrorists, criminals, and pedophile rings to the ways in which their communications are being intercepted. The so-called Islamic State is a beneficiary. We see the Islamic State, for example, putting out advice on how to cooperate securely. That change of, of emphasis for them, I'm sure, is caused to some degree by Snowden. How do you regard Edward Snowden? Mm. As a traitor, what he has done has caused irreparable damage to our ability, other agencies' ability to protect the people we are sworn to protect. Um, and he's given a roadmap um, to many foreign services and terrorist groups as to how we operate. How do you think terrorist groups regard Edward Snowden? Probably as a hero. He has given them an edge. I'm an edge that hurts us in our ability to protect those that we serve. I've spoken to many intelligence agencies, both in the UK and in America, and senior individuals from those agencies. And when I ask them that question, they say, without exception, that you have done great damage. Whenever we hear these claims of damage from government officials, universally they've occurred without any evidence. There's never been a specific case of an individual who's harmed as a result of these disclosures. There's never been a specific case of a terrorist that got away or an attack that occurred. Aren't you a traitor? Of course not. Uh, the question is, if I was a traitor, who did I betray? I gave all of my information to American journalists and free society generally. What you betrayed, I suggest, is the American people because you betrayed the intelligence agencies whose prime responsibility is to protect the American people. An argument could be made that I betrayed the government to protect the people. The question is not, what is the individual who revealed this, a good person or a bad person? The question is, how did these programs come to be? And how do we stop them from occurring again in the future? The new legislation will also cover another contentious issue. Access to data held by social media companies like Facebook, Google and Twitter. Platforms on which we now conduct most of our personal communications. It's really a question of free enterprise. Who do companies work for? Do they work for their customers or do they work for governments? Facebook is one of the global giants of the social media world, with over a billion users a day and revenues of 10 billion pounds a year. To Facebook, terrorist content on its pages is a highly sensitive issue. It's tragically illustrated by the murder of Gunnar Lee Rigby, hacked to death in Woolwich by two British jihadis in 2013. The press blamed Facebook. We were all horrified by the vicious murder of Lee Rigby. That case and others like it show how hard it is for the authorities whose job it is to try and detect this kind of activity before an incident like this happens, how hard it is for them to do that. In our case, we rely on reports from our users and requests from the authorities in order to keep terrorist content and terrorist activity off Facebook. Six months before the murder, one of the killers, Michael Adebowale, was communicating on Facebook with an Al-Qaeda suspect in the Middle East, codenamed Foxtrot. The exchange involved Adebowale saying he wanted to murder a soldier. One of the ways discussed was use of a knife. At the time, neither Facebook nor the intelligence agencies knew of the exchange. It was only after Lee Rigby's murder that GCHQ became aware of the communication. Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee investigated the case. What might have happened if Facebook had notified the intelligence services? If their computers 
had identified this particular comment, which they, they clearly ought to have done, and if they had had a procedure uh, for that involving someone in Facebook deciding whether it should be reported to the police, then that could have prevented Lee Rigby's death. Unfortunately, I can't comment on that individual case, but I can assure you that we take our responsibilities extremely seriously in this place. Precisely how and why Facebook missed the exchange and failed to pick up the warning signs remains a mystery. Facebook told us they were not prepared to go into detail. We've made important strides in the last three years to, to ensure that Facebook is a hostile place for terrorists. And in rare circumstances where we find somebody organizing activity which may pose an imminent risk to life, then we can and do report those people to the authorities. The issue of access to social media is equally sensitive in America, where most of the companies are based. I would call it the Snowden hangover. Some feel that if they are seen working with the government, it's going to hurt their brand name, it's going to hurt their business. Um, so it has had an impact. Isn't the priority of the social media companies the bottom line? They have to stay competitive in a global market, so there is this kind of tension uh, between us who are responsible for public safety and the companies that are responsible for providing a service to their customers and being responsive to their, their, uh, their stockholders and the board of directors. Social media companies, it seems to me, have to act as good citizens, just as the rest of us do. What I think you can't do is try to enlist the social media companies into being effectively detectives or agents of the state, um, because they're not that. How does Facebook track and identify terrorist content on its platform? Facebook doesn't track terrorist content, it doesn't monitor people's messages. However, what we do do is rely on reports from the 1.5 billion people using Facebook to let us know when they see things on Facebook that shouldn't be there, including terrorist activity. And then also we get requests for data from the police in this country and elsewhere. There is no algorithm that finds terrorist content. Surprising, as it's always been assumed that Facebook had a mechanism for detecting terrorist content. That's an example of the lack of proactive support that these companies are giving to us in some cases. Banks will tell us about what look like corrupt money is going through their system. I don't see why social media and communication companies can't adopt the same approach. The problem is now compounded by encryption, which means that when a message is sent, words become a jumble of impenetrable numbers and return to words when they reach the recipient. The data is undecipherable in transit. Encryption's uh, a massive problem. We are operating with increasing digital blind spots. So whether it's about encrypted devices or encrypted files on devices, or whether it's about encrypted communications, um, those are big challenges for us, which makes our operation to protect the public um, much more difficult. Edward Snowden isn't responsible for the increasing use of encryption, but he may have accelerated the process. There's a presumption in the question that encryption is a problem. Uh, well, it is for governments, it is for agencies who want to access critical data that they can't get because it's encrypted. Only if they want to collect it on an indiscriminate basis. Governments, as we've discussed in the context of iPhones and other devices, retain an ability to compromise targeted devices, an individual, anytime they want. Another suggestion is that the companies provide the agencies with a key that would unlock encrypted messages. How realistic is that? The scientific community has arrived at a consensus uh, that it simply cannot be done in a safe and secure way. Are you saying that it is technically impossible to devise a backdoor to encrypted communications? Correct. We've split the atom and we've put a man on the moon. We have some of the brightest people working for those companies and we have some very bright people in the government. And I think if the will was there, we could come up with a solution. Do you think the will is there? The will is not there right now. Facebook insists a backdoor key is not necessary. 
There is no need for a key for the authorities because they have a well-established mechanism to ask us for data, and encryption does not prevent them in any way from asking us for exactly the same data today as they did two years ago and will do in two years' time. But if they come to you and say, we want access to this particular piece of data, which is encrypted, can you decrypt it for them? Yes, we can. How difficult is it for you to get the data that you require from social media companies? Some are helpful, some are extremely un unhelpful. Do they see themselves having a, a social responsibility to help the police and intelligence agencies catch fraudsters, um, paedophiles, terrorists, or do they step back and say, we just run a secret system, it's not our business? Edward Snowden will follow the parliamentary debate he has helped inform from afar. But what is likely to happen to him? Is he doomed forever to remain in Moscow, or will he return home to America, stand trial, and go to jail for what he has done? The charges against you under the Espionage Act is theft of government property, you stole top secret information, unauthorized communication of national defense information, what you did was unauthorized, willful communication of classified communications, intelligence inf information to an unauthorized person, and you distributed to unauthorized individuals. On the face of it, on those three charges, are you not guilty as charged? Certainly not in a fair trial. The Espionage Act finds anyone guilty who provides any information to the public, regardless of whether it's right or wrong. You aren't even allowed to explain to a jury what your motivations were for revealing this information. It's simply a question of, did you reveal information? If yes, you go to prison for the rest of your life. I want him to face the American court system and a jury of his peers. I mean, he makes the claim that my entire purpose for this was to get it out to the American public. Well, come on back, Edward, and let the American public pass judgment. Would you be prepared to do some kind of deal, some kind of plea bargain? Uh, of course. I've, I've uh, volunteered to go to prison with the government many times. What I won't do is I won't serve as a deterrent to people trying to do the right thing in difficult situations. But you would be prepared to face a jail sentence, would you? Of course. What would you be looking to from them for you to return? Well, so far they've said they won't torture me, which is a start, I think. Um, but we haven't gotten much further than that. But it's something you're actively, or you and your lawyers are actively discussing with the government, I assume. We're still waiting for them to call us back. Edward Snowden has done harm to the ability of this country to protect itself, particularly in the short term. But I think you could also say uh, that he's done us a service by ensuring that these intrusive powers will be publicly debated and properly provided for in law. What is going to happen to Edward Snowden? If you're asking me my opinion, he's going to die in Moscow. He's not coming home. Do you have any regrets about what you've done? I regret that I didn't come forward sooner. Because the longer you wait with programs like this, the more deeply entrenched they have become. I have paid a price, but I feel comfortable with the decisions I've made. If I'm gone tomorrow, uh, I'm happy with what I had. I feel blessed. I've been getting old.